What's going on, adventurers? Hope everybody is having a great day. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Adventure One podcast. So today I am recording this outside because it is an absolutely beautiful day. So apologize in advance if you hear a little bit of wind noise, a little bit of environment happening around me. But I am actually at my South Texas deer camp. And I hope everybody is having a great day and everybody is excited as I am that deer season is finally here. So when I'm recording this, it's beginning of October. Uh, I think a lot of places opened up October 1st. Some places obviously have been opening up before then, but I think a lot of the southern states finally open up this weekend, including Texas. So that's what I'm down here doing. Um, had a hunt last night that didn't go so great. Then I had a hunt this morning where I saw tons of deer and I just wasn't quite sure on what I wanted to shoot. Um, just in terms of opportunity wise, I just kind of kept waiting to see what else would show up. And then I realized, Hey, there's this buck that was borderline a cull buck that I wasn't sure about. And then after seeing him for a while, I think now I'm convinced that I'm probably going to put an arrow through him if I see him again, but otherwise, um, I'll probably go for a doe. But that was this morning, good hunt, now it's kind of that midday lull. So I had lunch, took a little bit of a nap, and now I'm sitting outside because it's beautiful weather. It's about 80 degrees, which is cool, believe it or not, <laughs> for South Texas. I know a bunch of people up north would think that's ridiculous, that 80 degrees is nice, cool, great deer hunting weather, but for opening weekend down here. I mean, that's pretty darn good. Uh, I think the low was 59 or 60, which is not especially cool. Uh, but man, I'll take it. That's pretty good. So I wanted to take this time to reminisce a little bit on my last hunt. And my last hunt was not down here in Texas. In fact, it was up in Montana, very far from here. And it was my second ever archery elk hunt. So Awesome experience, um, and I think this hunt, like my last hunt, I'm just going to cut to the chase. I did not kill an elk, so if you just want to hear a success story, sorry, that's not the story that I'm giving today, but today I wanted to recap some lessons learned from that hunt because I think these apply to elk, and I'm kind of novice when it comes to elk. I've killed a bunch of whitetail, killed a bunch of pigs, but I've spent a total of about 10 days elk hunting. But both times I went, it was very much, I think there's people who are way more hardcore than I was, but it wasn't lackadaisical by any means. It was absolutely hunt every day, morning and night, hike 8 to 10 miles a day, um, pretty aggressive style hunting, lots of calling, lots of hiking, lots of covering ground. And I've pretty much decided that I want my first elk to be with a bow. And that just is what is going to make it more meaningful to me. And I think last year on my hunt, if I had a rifle and I was taking a 200 yard shot on a bull, I would have had one down. And I can say the same thing this year. I think probably maybe even the first day, but probably the second day I would have had a shot at a really nice bull. But with archery, everything gets a little bit more complicated and it's way harder, and to be honest, that's kind of why I like it. It's the challenge, it's, yeah, it's the frustration, and why would I say I like the frustration? Well, I think it's just, it makes the highs higher, but to do that, the lows are lower, and so I'm kind of coming through a low after this last hunt. So it was with a outfitter and a guide service, and that's something that's not really my typical style. I definitely don't have anything against people who hunt with an outfitter or a guide. Um, it's just a little bit different, and there are some guides and outfitters out there that are just absolutely incredible, um, both in their knowledge and skill on the game and area they're hunting, but also just incredibly nice, generous individuals but then there are also some guides, especially down here in South Texas, that are not licensed guides. They're just the guy who fills the feeders and kind of runs the day-to-day -day operations of a ranch. And they're helpful and nice guys a lot of times, but it, it's a money machine rather than truly what a guide service actually is, I would say, which is um, part of the service industry. 
and and a guide's job generally is to just put the to serve the client to put the client on an animal and the guide can't guarantee a shot can't guarantee your accuracy but he can put the client on an animal and so this hunt was a chance to hunt with a guide service um, and it was more because I got hooked up with these guys who were doing another hunt and then I kind of hopped in um, I guess to shortcut the rabbit trail kind of on the marketing side of it um, I was involved there were some other people from some other brands and other content creators involved and so I kind of got to tag along for this hunt and so yeah, I paid for my tag, paid for my travel, all that stuff. Um, so it was by no means a give me. Um, but got to hunt with a guide out there who was very knowledgeable. And on this hunt, it was central Montana, so very rugged. Um, I wouldn't say mountainous as much as just extreme hills. Um, there were no peaks and incredibly steep things we had to climb, not like Colorado. Um, not even like what I experienced in Idaho, but just big, wide open terrain. And we would glass and see a bull maybe a mile away and need to try to get over to him or try to make a plan for the next sit. Well, it wasn't even really a sit, but the next morning or evening period to try to make an opportunity happen there. Uh, so we covered a whole lot of ground. And it was interesting um, just seeing how much we patterned these elk very similarly to kind of the way I pattern whitetail down here versus my first hunt in Idaho where it was all in the mountains chasing them basin to basin. It was a little bit different. It was very much um, just when you see them, make a plan, go after them. And it was a little less strategic and more just kind of high energy scramble. This was a little bit more strategic and planning your sits and planning, you know, where you want to be at a certain time, very much like deer hunting. And uh, I actually did not get a shot opportunity until almost the last day. It was the second to last day. Um, and I was with the guide. We were working one bull. Um, we were at a great place where I think they were down in an alfalfa field in the evening and then we're going up into the hills, into little patches of dark timber during the day. Um, they had done that in numerous times, um, probably even since well before I was there. That was kind of their pattern, just their food-to-bed pattern. Um, but I had observed them doing that. It just seemed like it was a different field in a different basin, a lot of t or in a different patch of timber, excuse me, a lot of the times. It wasn't always the same one. So when we figured out or had a pretty good hunch of uh, which field they were going to be feeding in at night and kind of where they were going to go up during the day. Basically, we pulled over off the side of the road. We heard them, um, and then they were already pretty much headed to the hills by the, time, by the time we were in there moving. And so we were moving probably an hour before dawn, um, kind of going up the slope, just chasing bugles, hearing them. And then we felt like we were getting pretty close to one bull, um, and the guide was calling, mostly cow calling, bugling a little bit, and he'd get a response, and this bull started working in. And in elk hunting, there's just this classic decision that you have to make. Do I sit in front of the tree or do I sit behind the tree? There's an advantage and a disadvantage to either choice. So if you set up in front of a tree when a bull's coming, you're a lot easier to pick out. Even if you've got awesome camouflage, just a human form, does not look like a tree. So it's important to have something behind you, but you're just not behind cover. So you're more visible for sure, especially when you move because elk and deer have excellent eyesight when it comes to catching movement. And you're just really vulnerable uh, when you're standing out in front of cover. But there's nothing in your way when you need to draw, when you need to take a shot. So your shot opportunity is probably going to be a lot better. Versus if you hide behind cover, generally behind a tree, behind a pine or a cedar, if you're elk hunting, um, yeah, you're going to be in a lot better cover. You're going to hide a whole lot better. But by the time a bull comes running in, how do you get around the tree? How do you shoot? How do you, how do you manipulate that? And so I've kind of defaulted to generally staying in front of cover with trying to kind of not silhouette or skyline myself to have a shape behind me 
And that's helped a lot. But anytime you can kind of find a place where you can wedge in between so you have maybe a little bit of low cover in front of you but high cover behind you, I think that's the best of both worlds. So that's kind of the decision I had to make as this first bull was coming in. He was coming up a draw. Uh, I got in front of a tree and we saw him coming up, um, but he hung up at about 100 yards. And the, it was so exciting to see this big, big mature bull just screaming his head off. Um, but ultimately he stopped. He kind of, I don't know if he had just been fighting all night and it was just tired and exhausted, but he kind of decided that he didn't want anything to do with it. And he just kind of lumbered off um, and dropped into the next valley over where I think he was just trying to bed down. Sorry if you're getting any wind noise here. It's the wind's picking up a little bit. Um, but he dropped over the next valley. And so we basically said, yeah, we could probably charge in after him, but I don't think the wind's going to be in our favor. Uh, it's going to be a rough one to try to hunt. Um, so let's go find something else. And about when we had seen him drop over, I actually spotted another bull going up the next ridge. And then we just sat there for about 30 minutes and watched and nothing came out. So we knew that he bedded down in the timber on that ridge. So we hiked over there got set up and the guide was great in instructing me what to do. And it was a very classic play, um, just keying in off the insta instincts of a bull that's maybe not a super mature bull, but just predicting what he was likely to do. So we kind of went on the downward side of this patch of timber, which obviously you want to do so they have no chance of smelling you. Um, the guide set up right kind of at the edge of the tree line and then there was a little bit of a dip. And so he was, you know, quite a bit higher in elevation as I walked into the timber a little bit, not too far, about 30 yards into the timber. But it was a pretty steep slope. So I ended up probably going down about 30 feet below where he was elevation wise. And we knew that the bull was on the next rise as that dip kind of went back up on the other side. He was in there somewhere. Um, and so he started cow calling, um, just after a couple calls, I thought I saw movement. So I pulled up my binos and I was just glassing. And then I actually saw a hint of an antler move way, way back through the woods. And it turns out he was probably about 150 or 200 yards. And I actually saw the bull lift his head up and he was bedded down. And so he got up, started walking around acting like he was going to come into the call, but then was kind of hesitant and started kind of trotting back and forth. And then he trotted away from us for just a second. And I was wondering what happened. And then I caught him again, moving this time over to the right. And I think what he had done, he was bedded down and there was another bull there. And so I don't know if he was intentionally getting that other bull out of his bed or had bumped that other bull out of his bed and they just had a little mini confrontation. But either way, he was up, moving over to his right, and now two bulls were coming. So this whole time, I'm sitting there with a camera guy behind this giant log, this huge old pine tree that had fallen down kind of in that ditch that we were sitting in. And so it was great cover from about waist level down and so we could kind of half squat and peek over the top of it that's how I was glassing um, and that way we I could still potentially shoot over the top of it if I needed to but I was covered a little bit from the front and then had some thick bushes behind me and then another 50 yards behind me the guide was calling so we started seeing the elk walk over to our right um, he was still probably a hundred yards ahead of me. And I, at this point, I had arranged every tree between me and where that elk was bedded because my last pin was at 70. And if I had time and it was a good broadside shot and felt really steady, I, I feel totally fine taking a shot at 70. But if it was rushed, probably not. So I had ranged all the trees between me and those bulls, but then they kind of came outside of the trees and started walking on the edge of the tree line, which threw me off a little bit. But what threw me off more is that there were two when I was expecting one. And so every move I made, either with my rangefinder or with my body, I was trying to keep an eye on both bulls because I didn't want to be watching one and then have the other one buzz me. So as I was watching them start to circle around and come our way, coming to the cow call, 
I was just trying to be very conscious there and not blow out one or let one spot me while I was hiding from the other. And then one was kind of hidden behind some trees and I waited till the other one couldn't see me. And that's when I ducked down and turned and these bulls were almost directly to my right and the wind was in my face the whole time. And so I knew at this point that the bull was trying to go down to the call and get downwind of the call and smell the cow. And it totally makes sense, a move that I should have anticipated. The guide, I'm sure, probably did anticipate that because that's why he was set up behind me. Um, But I had not ranged anything behind me. And I hadn't really looked at how steep that slope was. And so when that elk came around behind me, I just saw him pop out, and he was pretty close. And I saw that slope, and I saw a very narrow window where the elk that was still in the back was hidden but I had a good clear broadside shot at the lead bull and so from then I just decided now's the time and so I stood up and drew in one motion and actually I whispered to the camera guy stay down and I I don't know if he heard me or not but I actually drew almost over his back lined up my bow on the elk and then I realized I didn't have a good range here and so I just kind of had to guess it and so just I had heard so many stories of people seeing these elk, whitetail hunters seeing elk, and then just they were not used to an animal that big. And so they assumed that the animal was way further away when actually the animal was up close. And I think that that story had been rattling around in my head all week. So I kept telling myself that elk is probably actually further than I think he is. I do not want to compensate the wrong way. And guess what I did? I I took that and I ran with it too far. I settled down with my bow, had my red pin right on his vitals, which is my 40-yard pin, because I realized, you know, that looks about right. Maybe he's a little closer, but I'm I want to make sure that I'm assuming that he's further instead of being thrown off by the size. And there's a little bit of a slope here. So, you know, when you're shooting up a slope, you would actually aim a little bit longer normally than you would if you were shooting flat or downhill so settled my 40 yard pin right on the vitals but he saw me when I drew and when I settled down and so that elk was looking right at me fortunately I was still enough that he didn't blow out immediately but I realized I didn't have time to get a range I had to just either shoot or not and so I let it fly and when I did one of the first things that I noticed was some sort of grass or brush fly up and as I shot and heard the arrow fly off, and did not hear an impact, I thought, oh no, I hit a branch, or I hit some grass. Somehow I hit something, there was a deflection when I saw that. And even sat down before we went and looked, uh, camera guy replayed the footage, and sure enough, we saw that little piece of grass fly up. Then I looked at it closer, and I realized on the footage, when the elk had walked in, he had some grass, or some branches or twigs or something actually stuck up in his antlers. So I don't know if he had been kind of digging in the ground or raking a tree shortly before that, but there was some junk in his antlers. And then when I shot, he twitched and turned his head. And that's actually that grass flying out was what I saw. So then I had a little bit of hope that, well, that wasn't from my arrow hitting something. I didn't cut off some grass or a limb. Maybe I had clean arrow flight, but we kept watching it, and I think my arrow went. We didn't get a great look at it because for some reason my lighted knock either did not turn on or I was so backlit and the exposure of the camera was trying to expose to the dark foreground that by the time the arrow went up higher, you just you couldn't see a knock or anything. You could kind of see where it went, but then it just kind of disappeared in the bright sky. And so I think I shot right over his back. And so I didn't know what happened. Um, And then I realized, well, I had been carrying around this rangefinder all week. I had ranged every tree between where this bull came from and where I was. But when it came down to it, I hadn't actually ranged where the bull was. So I went up. I asked the camera guy to stay sitting there at that log. He sat there. I walked up and stood right where the elk was. I found his tracks and ranged back. And it was 28 yards. And I had just massively misjudged the range. And again, I think it was just a uh, combination of me 
not wanting to assume that the animal was close just because he was big. And so just overcompensating there and the slope. And then, I don't know, I was just in a hurry. So I just, I guess, wasn't thinking clearly. And what I was convinced was 40 yards was way under that. And what really sucks thinking about it is I could have just pulled up my top pin and it would have been on. Yeah, I would have hit low, but it would have been in the vitals. And guess what? If I had put my 30 pin, it would have been money. It would have been perfect. But the drop between 30 and 40 is just enough, or 28 rather, and 40 is just enough that of the three realistic pins that I could have chosen, I picked the only one that wasn't good. And I sent it just inches over his back. And that was a huge lesson learned to me. Not only carry your rangefinder and range every tree, and I'm so used to on whitetail that are always moving around and are really jumpy, I don't think I've really ever had a chance to range the animal. Usually I'm ranging, okay, that fence post, okay, that tree, okay, that white rock over there. And I kind of memorize those ranges and kind of lay out my battlefield. And then when a deer walks up, you know, I know that stump is at 30, and I know that fence post is at 25, so okay, he's at 27, easy enough. But on an elk, I'm just not used to judging it like that. And so I realized the importance of trying to range the animal it is critical. And even if I had taken a second when I thought I had no time and I thought I needed to pull off a shot right then and there, well, I did, and that's how I missed. Versus if I had taken an extra second to not draw my bow, but instead get an accurate range on him, and then ultimately I think he I got his attention when I drew the bow, not the movement of me turning around. So I think I probably could have got away with it if I had ranged the bull, given an extra second, drew then, and then sent it. That would be the difference between me coming home with empty coolers and me having a freezer full of elk right now. So that was a painful lesson to learn. And I I don't know what's more painful when you go out on a hunt and you just feel duped, like these animals are picking up on everything you do and you can never get ahead of them, or when you just screw something up that's simple. And this was definitely the latter. The animal had not outsmarted me. Um, we keyed in on him. We knew exactly what he was going to do, um, or close enough that it was, you know, of the eight miles that we had already walked in that morning to get close to that bull. Eh, I'm exaggerating. It was probably six miles that we had already closed to get into that bull. It ultimately came down to a difference of about 12 yards. And I just did something stupid and used the wrong pin. And you hear a lot of people say that. They're like, oh, I used the wrong pin. And that can come from another number of things. It can come from people literally looking at the wrong pin and ranging it. And usually... That is somebody who is, you know, practices so much at 20 yards. And then their other pins are sided in, but they practice so much at 20 yards that they have a habit of just lining up their 20 yard pin. Um, didn't do that. In this case, using the wrong pin was not a pin or sight mistake. It was a ranging mistake. I have a good range finder. And I know how to use it and I use it a lot, but I didn't use it when it actually counted. So that was a huge lesson learned um, that resulted in a miss and a lost arrow, and why I do not have an elk in my freezer right now. Other things on this trip, man, my gear, I feel like was pretty solid. Um, In fact, I was, I had packed really light and came in really light um, more than anybody else because a lot of people were driving into this hunt and I was, I think I was the only one flying actually. And so I wanted to make a point to come in light so that I could hopefully come out heavy. So I had actually packed all my gear in a cooler and then had purchased a separate soft-sided collapsible cooler. I may do a video someday on my cooler system, kind of explaining how they nest. And one thing that I had figured out pretty early on is all these good coolers, these modern Yetis and Arctics and Orca coolers, they work awesome for keeping stuff cold. But they are so damn heavy that they are just horrible for air travel. And yeah, even if it keeps your meat cold for six days, well, that doesn't matter for a flight that is three hours. 
So you just need the lightest possible cooler that's going to get it done. So I was really happy with my system. I had packed light, but in general, I feel like all my gear was spot on. What I probably didn't bring enough of was camp clothes, just because I knew we were going to hunt and you know, the idea of going on a hunt and wearing the same hunting clothes for five days, I don't know. To some people, maybe that's gross or maybe that's weird or maybe to some eastern whitetail hunters, just the idea of, you know, stinking up the same clothes that you're going to hunt in is just grossly offensive. But I don't know. I'm I'm kind of used to it. And I'd kind of learned through um, just a little bit of western style spot and stock hunting. You know, that's just how it is sometimes. And that's why playing the wind is so important. Because scent control, yeah, it can work for a little while, but long term, like you're just not going to be able to do it. So I was pretty used to that idea. Maybe could have brought some other camp clothes. Um, one thing that I, after my kind of backcountry hunt the previous year, where we had spike camped pretty much the whole time, I had a tent and sleeping pad and sleeping bag and everything on my back the whole time, um, and we would try to find elk and then sleep close to them. This hunt was all in. Uh, montana canvas wall tents so and with a heater and so it was a lot more cozy and comfortable and so i had actually brought my catadine uh water filter and a bunch of mountain house meals and my lightest weight sleeping bag and a lightweight uh blow up air mattress and just a lot of my lightweight gear that ultimately i didn't need any of it so i think it was good that i had it but in the idea of trying to pack light, it comes down to packing efficient. If I packed light with other things but brought gear that I didn't end up using, that was still a mistake. So I think a lesson learned there is just with anybody else who's going on the hunt, whether it's a guide or an outfitter, um, just clarify your gear. Like even if you feel like you're being obnoxious, because I was just kind of joining in on this hunt, so I didn't want to ask too many questions. I just wanted to show up with everything I needed. Um and again, would have been fine if I was driving in, but just clarify, hey, what's the likelihood that we're actually going to spike out to the point, like, do I even need to bring this gear? Just a good question to ask, a good thing to think about. But otherwise, um, my bow, all my accessories, my arrows, I did a whole video on my bow setup that I'm using. Um, it was actually down at this ranch where I'm sitting right now, uh, but that's the exact same setup I used, and I was very happy with how that worked. Um, I was using a new bino harness from Badlands that worked out great. Uh, Sig Kilo rangefinder that is a very accurate rangefinder. But as I said, my biggest lesson learned is I got to use the darn thing. So hopefully that's kind of an entertaining story. Maybe you can pick up on something where you can learn from my mistake, uh, learn a little bit of a lesson here. But I mostly just kind of wanted to sum up that trip. What happened? When I got an opportunity and did not end up with a bull. I wish I had had multiple opportunities because with archery, I mean, you're bound to screw up some of them. You just got to get so close and there's just so many variables that go right that in the end of the day, it's, you're going to, you know, it's, you got to take a swing at it, even if you not, you're not a hundred percent confident that you're going to hit it. And that's what I did. And it failed this time. So I wish I had more opportunities, but Hopefully there's some lessons learned here. I know there are definitely some lessons learned for me and I kind of caught the bug and probably I'm going to go on an elk hunt again in the future, probably next year. I don't know if it's going to be Montana or Idaho or Colorado. Still got to figure all that out. Um, between getting drawn with points or over the counter, it can get kind of complicated, but I want to make it happen again and apply some of these lessons that I've learned. So hope you found that helpful. Maybe this was just kind of fill in some time while you're taking a road trip or just kind of an entertaining story about my elk hunt. But guess what? Right now, it's getting to be about that time where I got to get ready for my evening hunt. So I'm going to shut it down, throw on my camo, grab my bow, head out to the stand, and wish me luck. Till next time, stay safe, be free, and never stop seeking adventure.